What's up, Blueprint? It is exciting to come before you again. We are continuing in our series and we are gonna be jumping right into the text today. So if you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and pick up in Isaiah chapter nine. We're gonna be looking at verses one and then we're gonna end at verse seven. Isaiah nine, one through seven. It says this, nevertheless, the gloom of the distressed land will not be like that of the former times when he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will bring honor to the way of the, to the, way of the sea, to the land east of the Jordan and to Galilee of the nations. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on those in the land of darkness. You have enlarged the nation and increased its joy. The people have rejoiced before you, and as they rejoice at harvest time, and as they rejoice when dividing the spoils, for you have shattered their oppressive yoke, and the rod on their shoulders, and the staff on their oppressor, of their oppressor. Just as you did on the day of Midian, for every trampling boot, of battle and bloody garments of war will be burned as fuel for the fire. For, and this is what we read at the beginning, for a child will be born for us. A son will be given to us and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast and its prosperity will never end. And he will reign on the throne of David and, on, and over his kingdom and establish and sustain with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this task. And so let's go before our Lord and let's pray that God will show up and meet us in this text today. Father, we're thankful for this opportunity. And as we've read the words that we just read, Lord, I pray that those words would sink into our soul. Father, it would integrate into our heart. And Father, it would come out into how we live and we move and we have our being. Lord, give us hope in this season. Give us peace. Give us rest. Give us what we need, Father. And we'll do our best to give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. So be with us, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen and amen. Let me just kind of kick it off with a story that, um, that, I, that kind of brings about this season and kind of takes on the season and really what we'll be talking about today. Um, one of my friends, you know, he is a believer and he has spent a lot of his time just kind of, you know, going before the Lord, spending time with the Lord. And he, and he really regularly practices this idea of fasting, right? And so over this time, one of his fasts, he was doing a, one of his many 40-day fasts that he's done over his life. And so he was doing a 40-day fast. I mean, you know, and during this 40-day fast, all he would drink is just simply water. It is water. It was a 40-day water fast. I don't know if you've ever done that. I, I can't say, and I can't confess, I'm not that spiritual that I've not been able to do that um, as at this point in my, uh, my journey with the Lord. However, like this guy was in his 40-day fast, and as he was in his 40-day fast, he came to the end of it. It was 40 days in. Just like you, he spent this time, he's wrapping it up, he's praying, and then, okay, at the end of the 40-day, he comes, he's like, I'm ready to eat, right? This, I've, I've sacrificed before the Lord, I'm ready to eat, and, you know. So he walks into the kitchen, ready to eat, looks through all, all the cabinets, and, you know, and he looks in, he's like, man, you know what, I'm going to get a, a can of beans, Right. And so that's what he's choice. He's going to get a can of beans. So like he grabs the can of beans and, you know, that's the most accessible thing. And he's hungry. He's like, I just eat anything at this time. So he's walking around looking in his kitchen. And guess what? He could not find a can opener. All right, so here he is, having eaten for 40 days. He's looking for a can of beans. That's really, that's all that's has because he hasn't been shopping. He's there, he has this can of beans, but he can't find a can opener. The way it was told to me is that he had a roommate, right? And his roommate basically said that he was looking, he was being asked, like his roommate didn't know where the can opener was. And so his roommate leaves, right, to go do something. And then when he comes back, this person, my friend, is eating the beans. And he's just like, what happened? 
Like, how did you get the beans open? He looked and somehow God endowed him at that time with supernatural strength. And he literally, with his hand, rips open the beans with his bare hands. And then he just started to finish. And he started eating the beans. And, you know, you're thinking, like, what in the world is happening? And, you know, I tell that story for this in light of what we're talking about is that desperate times calls for desperate measures. Desperate times call for desperate measures. And, you know, I know you're not like him. We're not doing 40-day fast. We're not doing these things. But the bottom line is, is that we are in 2020 and we are in desperate times. When, when I think about what we're doing, you know, even just sharing right before we were doing the video, just talking like that we are all in an adjustment period, doing things that we don't normally do, adjusting um, to the new normal, trying to abide, trying to do it, grieving the sadness of not being able to go spend time with our loved ones. And it's in this time, in this Christmas season, and you know, is that we, it seems like there's a time where we're reflecting and we're, we're supposed to reflect about the joy, you know, the advent, the joy of the Lord coming, you know, but like 2020, this is also a time, you know, that we are able to reflect on like, man, there's so much that's changed. There's so much loss. There's so much pain. There's so much that we're not able to do, you know, and that is, can be burdenful. That can, you know, create in this mind, the mindset in this, that this is desperate times. And in desperate times, that oftentimes calls for desperate measures. And so what I want to do today is, as, you know, as we continue in our series at Advent and talking about this thread that has been going on, just talking about what does it look like for us to have perfect peace in the midst of desperate times? Perfect peace in the midst of de desperate times. Times And today, as we've already read, we're looking at the book in Isaiah, Isaiah 9, 1 through 7, and really just going to break it down is that there's a problem that we all have is that desperate times sometimes require desperate measures. So there's the problem. But then we're going to look at the solution that in what Advent is supposed to do and, and how Advent reminds us what we ought to do in the midst of desperate times. And then we're going to look at an application about what we are to do in the midst of these desperate times. And in this, I want you to kind of understand in the midst of this series, in the midst of what we're doing, is, is that Advent reminds us of our perfect peace in these desperate times. So let's look at it. Let's start off with the problem. The problem, right? And we've already said desperate times call for desperate measures. When we say that, what do we mean? What do we mean? Ultimately, what we mean is that our actions that may seem extreme under normal, under normal circumstances actually are appropriate during these times. That's what we mean when we say desperate times um, calls for desperate measures. It's like what was normal would not be normal in these times. And as I was going back to my friend, the fact that my friend ripped open a can of beans with his bare hands but you know, it's like, but it was some desperate times. His brother hasn't eaten for 40 days. So it's just like, yeah, uh, that makes sense. Because we're saying that, yeah, it, like what would seem extreme in normal circumstances, it's okay considering the times. Well, in Isaiah chapter 9, where we see this prophecy, um, we are in the midst of desperate times. The children of Israel are, are recognizing that, that if you understand that there was a divided kingdom that took place after David's rule, there was this kingdom that was divided and you had the, the people in the north and you had the people of the south. The people in the north was called Israel and the people in the south, they were considered Judah. And in this, what was taking place in this time is that Assyria was the people who was on the throne at the time. They were the conquering kingdom. And Assyria just in that time had conquered the people in the north. And so here you have Judah, what's going on that's taking place that Judah is living in fear because it's kind of like it's pending that it's about to come down on us. What took place to our brothers up in the north is now about to take place on us. And it is now we are put into desperate times. There's desperate times. And so what Isaiah does is that he comes in and he says like, how do I give you peace in the midst of these desperate times. So let's start off because there's conflict in the land, right? 
Verse 1, as we read, it says, nevertheless. He starts off with nevertheless, right? So what is he referring to? We'll get to that in a minute. It says, nevertheless, the gloom of the distressed land will not be like that of the former times when he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. So right here, what we see is that there is gloom and distressed land. That there's, there's, it's not as it needs to be. But in here, he tells them, nevertheless, so the question becomes, what, why is the land distressed? If you would look back one verse before that, in verse 21 of chapter 8, it kind of gives you context to what's going on. And it says, this is the desperate time that is calling for these types of desperate measures. Verse 21 says this, they will wander through the land, dejected and hungry, and when they are famished, they will become enraged and looking upward will curse their king and their God. So let's just look at 21 first. What do we see? We see people are wandering, people are dejected, they're hungry, people are famished, people are enraged, they're cursing the government, they're cursing God, there are people without hope. Right? We've already seen what a person can do in the midst of hunger, right? After 40 days, what they would end up doing. Right here, they're saying that they were wandering, they were dejected, they were hungry, they were famished, like all of these things. And so this, we would classify this as a desperate time. Right? They were people without hope. Verse 22 says this, they will look toward the earth and see only distress, darkness, and gloom of affliction. And they will, and they will be driven into thick darkness. So as this is taking place, they're wandering, they're dejected, they're cursing, they're cursing God, they're cursing their government, they're cursing everybody that they know to curse. They're mad, they're pissed off. If I can say that, they're pissed off. They're, this is desperate times, right? The, and then what happens is that they, they're now looking around for some relief and then they see, it's, they, they see only nothing but distress and more darkness and more gloom, right? And that causes them to go into a deeper darkness, right? There's no hope. There's no hope in the land. And so when there's no hope in the land, we're just going to keep going down. What, what do they end up doing? Verse 18 of chapter 8, it says this. It says, here I, here I am with the children of the Lord has given me to be signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of armies who dwell in Mount Zion. And this is what's taking place. Because when you don't have hope and when you don't think that any hope is coming, they, you begin to look for anything. You begin to grab on for anything and everything for a sense of hope. And so what it says this in verse, nine, in verse 19, it says, when they, the they are those people in Israel that are distressed, that is going into deeper darkness. When they say to you, inquire of mediums, and the spiritists who chirp and mutter, shouldn't a people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? They are asking anybody, you go to your God, you go to your God, just go to, I don't even care don't even, if it comes from your God, if it comes, like there's nothing, there's, there's a stress, we're in deeper darkness, we're in deeper pain, we need answers. And it doesn't seem like the God of Israel is showing up. Sounds a lot like 2020. Right? That we're in these times where we're going to all these different places where it's like, hey, let's go to this place. Let's go to that. Like the Bible doesn't have the answers. It doesn't have the questions. It seems like God is not speaking. Does he even care? Where are you, Lord? And so there's these desperate times. And so we go to anyone, anybody who has answers because we find ourselves going into darker and darker places. Darker, darker realities because we don't see any hope. We don't see anything. And, and while they were in desperate times, we are in some very similar desperate times. So the question becomes is what's the solution? That's the problem. That we recognize that desperate times cause for desperate measures. And so we understand why people are doing what they're doing in these times in 2020. We understand that what was taking place that was happening 2,000 years before the coming of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We understand that the land is being conquered by these Assyrians. And the Assyrians did not play. And it's coming, it's pending, it's coming our way. So desperate times call for desperate measures. Call on your God, call on anybody. There's no hope, there's no help. And so what's the solution? God calls us to trust that the fact that he is coming. He hears us and he 
is coming. So in this passage, we begin to look at like, what is, what, where does Isaiah get his strength in the midst of these desperate times to not go towards his natural inclination to do and go into self-preservation mode? Again, we're still in, um, we're still in the, the verse, but we get to the second half of the verse of chapter 9, verse 1, B. It says, after he's already said in the first, nevertheless, the gloom and the distressed land will not be like the like that of the former times when he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. We've already kind of established the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali is the land of Israel. That's the northern part of Israel. They're in Judah that is coming, right? So then he goes on in the second half of verse when he says, but in the future, he will bring the way to the way of the sea, to the land of the east of the Jordan, and to the Galilee of nations. So basically what you see and you have to kind of move on and then you recognize that the, that same land, right, Israel, the land of the Tilly and all that is the same land that he's talking about right here. The way of the sea, the land of the east, the, land of the east of the Jordan, the, the, the Galilee of nations. That he's referring to the same places. So he said, even though it looks desperate right now, and he says, he will bring. And I want you to hone in on that. He will bring. So the question becomes is, who is the he? Who is the he that will bring? And then it says, and in that, because of this fact, that it says the people that are now walking in darkness, and that's what I love, they are walking in darkness. It's like, he's not prettying up the fact of how bad 2020 is. He's not prettying up how bad it is in Israel at this time. That It's hard, it is bad, it is described as darkness. But it says the people walking in that darkness have seen a great light. It's like the dawn, the sunset, or the, the, it's coming, and that's how they describe it. A light has dawned. It's coming. There's, there's hope that's coming. And it says, a light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. They're living in the land of darkness. And in verse 3, he says, you have enlarged the nation and it increased its joy. So let's understand this picture in the midst of darkness, in the midst of all these things. We see this sunrise that is coming up, that is giving a little hope and a little joy. And it says in there, there's now increased joy. There's increased in large nations. And it says the people have rejoiced before you as they rejoiced at the harvest time, as they rejoice when dividing us spoils. And so basically he says, like, let me paint this picture. People are now went from gloom, but because of the hope of what's taking place, that now he totally flips the script and that there's a people still living in darkness, the same darkness that these other people are living, that this is a group of people that are representative of those who are putting their hope in the one that is coming. They are now seen as people rejoicing of the harvest time, that, that some plants some water, but now it's harvest time to gather based upon the work and the labor that has been taking place. They're receiving the, the fruit of the planting and the watering. They are receiving, receiving the spoils, they're dividing the spoils of the conquering king that came in. And so it's like, he's totally flipping the script, but in the midst of the time, what? They are, but all they can see is darkness. They don't, they see the coming, they see something's happening, but they're living in darkness. They're living in darkness. And what we see is that he, with that, that the hope that they have is that he will restore all of Israel. Because what we see is he's returning back. And what I love about this is that the, it's like, you know, between verses two and verse three, what we have is that there's about a 2,000 year gap that's taking place. 2,000 years. But in Matthew chapter 4, 11 through 16, I won't really go back and read it, but when we see Jesus right after his wilderness experience, right after um, he hears about John the Baptist being imprisoned, what we see is Jesus ministering in the land, as they talk about, the land east of the Jordan, the Galilee of Galilee, the way by the sea. And he's quoting Isaiah chapter 9, 2. Isaiah chapter 9, 3, he says, I told you I'll come back. I didn't forget you. I remember you. And he begins his ministry remembering about this promise that he had. So what we see is that God is intervening. 
He's intervening. And he intervenes with Isaiah and he gives him this hope, a hope that he plants in Isaiah and he calls him to defy his natural inclination in the current cultural climate to stand firm even in the midst of the dark times. Even though we all can understand the desperate times calls for desperate measures, he says, but let that not be true of you. There's still a way that you need to govern yourself. And, and for us to see this, where is kind of where God gives him this call? We see this in eight chapter, again, Isaiah 8 in verse 11. And this is kind of where it begins. He says, for this is what the Lord said to me with great power to keep me from going the way of this people. Do you, do you see what's going on in Isaiah? Isaiah is just as prone to do what everybody else is doing. He's just as prone to go the way of kind of self-preservation when there seems like there's only darkness around. That Isaiah is like, he says, to keep me from going the way of this people. He could easily be swept up into all of his friends and his family. It's just like, man, you better, you know, everybody else is doing, I need to do what everybody else is doing because desperate times require desperate measure. Like, I need to do that. But he says, the Lord came in and he spoke to him. And you know what he said? In verse 12 in chapter 8, he says, don't call everything a conspiracy that these people say is a conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be terrified. You are to regard only the Lord of hosts, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies as holy. Only he should be feared. Only he should be held at all. God calls Isaiah to trust him. Do you guys see that? He's calling him to, to, to trust him despite the natural inclinations to do what you feel like you need to do. Verse 14, he says, he will be a sanctuary. He will be your rest. He will be that sanctuary. But he says, but then there's, and then there, he says, but, and this is why I love the honesty of the Bible, but for the two houses of Israel, who are the two houses of Israel? It's Israel and Judah. The two houses of Israel, Israel, he will be a stone to stumble over, a rock to trip over, a trap in a snare of its inhabitants of Jerusalem. Why is he a stone? Why is he stumbling? Why? Because he's just like, God, where are you? We've been crying out. How are you letting this, this Assyrian army come and destroy us? How are you letting all these people come? How are you letting our people to continue to be persecuted? How are you allowing this to happen, God? Where are you? Are you an absentee landlord? Where are you, Lord? Where are you? And that becomes a stone. You don't care for us. Right? And then the enemy from the very beginning whispers in, your, in our ears, does God really love you? What is God holding back from you? Right? And this is what we see taking place and what what's happening in the text is that that becomes a stone for you in our natural inclinations because when no one else is coming for us, when no one else is there, what do we do? We got to take up our, our own, take up our own arms, take care of it of ourselves. Let's do what the culture naturally does. But what is Isaiah? He says, many will stumble over these. They will fall and be broken. They will be snared and captured. But then what we see is that Isaiah says this, he says, he says, he certifies basically what he's saying. He says, verse 16, bind up the testimony. Seal up the instruction among my disciples. What I'm saying, word is bond. This will come to pass. And so he says, and then he draws the line in the sand. He says, but listen, I will wait for the Lord who is currently hiding his face from the house of Jacob. I will wait for him. Do you guys hear the pain in that? Right? Oh, I know it's hope in there, but there's pain. God, you're hiding your face. Isaiah recognizes God. Right now, you are hiding your face. You are not showing up when we think, when we're calling out. Just like the people, where are you, Lord? This is happening just as much to him as it's happening to everyone else. But he, but he resolves in himself based upon that word that God has given him to keep him from his natural inclinations, to keep him from being swept away in the current culture. And he resolves in himself to say, I will wait for the Lord. I will wait for him. And he says that. And so what does this mean? And why is that connected to Advent? Advent reminds us of our offer of perfect peace. 
in desperate times. In desperate times. You see, this is the, the, the problem and the solution that God gives us. This is the problem and solution. So the question becomes is why are we to be reminded? Why are we to wait? And, and how does Advent helps us to wait and to give us peace, perfect peace in the midst of desperate times? Why is that the case? To go against our natural inclinations, to go against our natural tendencies here. Advent calls us to look to the hills from which our hope, which our help will come from. And this is where we pick it back up in verse 9, chapter, chapter 9, verse 4. And he gives us the reason. He says, for you have shattered their oppressive yoke and the rod on their shoulders, the staff of their oppressor, just as you did on the day of Midian, for every trampling boot of battle and every bloody garment of war will be burned as for a few for the fire. And then it goes on for unto us a child is born. What we see right here is that this passage crescendos, right? It started off in verse 8 and 11 when he gives this message to Isaiah to not go the way of the culture, to not to go against his inclinations. And then he goes and he tells us to, to wait and the dawn is coming, the sun is coming to wait and to be, to wait and to hope and his crescendos into this, to this peace. But what I want you to see in here is what happens. Is it in verse four, God is coming in and he's going to deliver them from their oppressor. In verse five, he's going to eliminate the threat of the enemy. In verse six, he's basically, we see that he's delivering a savior, right? When we see that in verse four, he shattered the oppressive yoke. That you, that there's going to be a day, I know for a season that it's going to feel, it's going to, you're going to feel the pain, but I'm going to shatter the, the oppressive yoke and the rod on your shoulders. I'm, and not only am I going to do that in verse five is that I'm going to overcome, like the, every trampling boot of battle and bloody garments will be burned away, will be gone. Like I'm going to eliminate the potential threat and there'll be perfect peace. There'll be shalom as we Say it. And not only that is that because I'm going to deliver and bring to you a child. You hear that? I'm delivering you a child. And this is where we talk about the perfect peace that in the midst of 2020, we are meant to be reminded in this series, in this time, that, that when we talk about this, this shalom, this perfect peace, because when he describes this child, he says this child will be born to us, this child will be given to us, and this child will, what, is, what does it say? The government, our dominion will be on his shoulders. He'll carry the weight of the burden. And he says he will be named Wonderful Counselor. He, like, he will be named Wonderful Counselor. He, is, he understands that his ways, he has the best ideas, the best strategies so we can follow him. He will be named Mighty God, that he defeats his enemies easily so we can hide behind him. He will be named um, um, Eternal Father, that he loves us endlessly, that his reign doesn't end in this love and this relationship that we can enjoy him forever. He will be named Prince of Peace, that he reconciles us while we were yet sinners, that he dies for us. He brings us together in his dominion, that he creates this dominion that where we can have perfect, where the word shalom, and that we got to understand what shalom is when it talks about peace. So when we talk about how do we have peace in the midst of desperate times, that we recognize that true peace isn't the absence of conflict. True peace isn't the absence of conflict, but it's taking what is broken and it's restoring it to wholeness. He's going to make us whole again. And it's in that that we find that when this idea that Christ is coming, it reminds us that he is the one who delivers us from the hand of our oppressors. He is the one who eliminates the threat from among us. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. And, he, and this Lord and Savior is who we call Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, that we rest in our shalom. We rest in the wholeness that God brings us in this time. But for you and I, it takes discipline. It takes discipline. And so how do we discipline ourselves in three ways? Number one, we got to bear the burden of hope. Number two, we got to blossom where we planted. And number three, we have to look to Jesus. What do I mean by that? Number one, bear the burden of hope. 
you know, all of us have to be rescued. Like the children of Israel needed to be rescued. We all need to be rescued. We all have this time. And, you know, whenever, have you ever asked the question, what is it like to, to wait to be rescued? Like you're just, there's nothing that you can do. I mean, just the other day we was driving down the, the, the highway and Angie and I, and, you know, we was actually going to church last Sunday. And, um, and what happened was, like in the midst of it, we saw this man and literally his hand, his arm was stuck under the car. The whole car collapsed on him. He was trying to fix his, his car and it, it collapsed. And we, we drive by and he's like, what, what, is something wrong with the man? He's, and then like, we was like, oh, what, you know? And so we drive by and then we have to make a U-turn. We get off the, one of the highways, we make a U-turn around and we see people stopping their cars and they're running back to the man because they see, but the man was in a position where all he can do is wait to be rescued. He's stuck in pain, and all he can do is wait. But in the midst of him waiting, he sees and feels the pain of waiting. He's stuck. He couldn't do anything. And what we see is that Advent, when we talk about Advent, Advent is the, is the first coming. It's about him coming, and as we look to his second coming, from the time, yes, Israel was delivered physically, but that fulfillment of this would not be fulfilled completely until 2,000 years later when Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus, 2,000 years later. And in that, there's this burden of hope that we have to bear. We bear the burden of hope, waiting. And there's pain in waiting. And our natural inclination is not to bear this pain, to escape our pain, take it and take up our own and our own. Just, let's do what the current culture is doing. But Advent tells us and reminds us to wait. And there's pain in waiting. But we look to the hills from which our hope comes from. And Christmas Day reminds us of this already but not yet reality. This Advent series reminds us of this already, but not yet. If you, I don't know if you guys have been reading. You've been reading some of just the devotionals that the elders have been putting together. But I would just charge you to do that. Read them. And every day feel the burden, the pain, as we wait for our Savior to come, as we look to the season that we understand that we're experiencing pain in the midst of it, but it's going against our natural inclinations and we're building in the discipline of bearing the burden of hope. But not only are we bearing the burden of hope, we ought to blossom where we're planted. First Corinthians chapter seven says, listen, everybody thinks the grass is greener on the other side. He says, let each one live his life in the situation the Lord has assigned when God called him. This is what I command in all the churches. This is what happens. Everywhere I go, people want, you got, you know, in the context of chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians, you got married people who wanted to be single. You had single people who wanted to be married. Like everybody, no one was content with their circumstances. And he says, listen, remain, blossom where you're planted, find your strength, bear the burden, understand that times are hard. 2020 is hard. But guess what? There's no escape from the pain. There's no way, there's no place as a way. There's no place because this world is tragic, but it's in the tragic nature of this world. Find God's, cling to God's faithfulness. He is faithful. He is coming. He will restore. He will bring hope. We got to hold on. And the Advent series reminds us that we can have peace in the midst of desperate times. So we got to bear the burden of hope. we got to blossom where we're planted, and we have to keep looking to Jesus. Don't take your eyes off Jesus in this season because that he is our wonderful counselor. He is our Prince of Peace. He is our everlasting Father. He is those things to us, and he gives us that. And as we look back and we look forward in this Advent series, we discipline ourselves to remain under the presence in, of, of our Lord and Savior. Look into Jesus as the dawn. And so it's in, even in the midst of dark times, we can look to the hills in which the sun has dawned. And we can see this already, but not yet. But it's in keeping our eyes to the hills where we're able to live this life with passion. Remember, passion is a willingness to endure the pain for something that's greater than the pain. And that's really my prayer for us. And I think that this is, where we, this is the way that we are able to find perfect peace in desperate times.
is by listening and looking to Jesus. And I really believe that Isaiah is calling us to do that, to find peace in the midst of the desperation of our times. I'm not gonna paint a great picture. Some of us, you know, what 2020 has brought, and I'm not making any promises that 2021 will be any better. But what I can give you and I can guarantee you is that our, our Lord and our Savior, he is still present. He is still on the throne. He still knows what to do. His reign is not over. He is. And so, brother, sister, as we, we bear the burden of hope and as we wait to his second coming, his second advent, let's hold on. Let's hold on. And let's remember that in our time with the Lord, in our, in our fellowship with one another. And in this time, let's remember the word that was given to Isaiah and, and the reason why it was given to Isaiah. And I'll end with this. He says, for this is what the Lord said to me with great power to keep me from going the way of this people. Let's hold on to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for this opportunity. We're thankful for the grace that you've given us, Lord. We pray for your will to be done. Father, we love you. We bless you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thanks for worshiping with us. For more information about Blueprint Church, visit us online at blueprintchurch.org. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Blueprint Church. Have a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday.